Uh, so hello, everybody. Huge thank you for joining us today for a discussion on standing out as a remote candidate. This is a lead dev webinar created in partnership with Hired. Uh, the webinar will last roughly 45 minutes, after which both myself and the panelists will head over to the lead dev Slack to answer some of your questions in the remote working channel. Now, I've had a chance to, to talk with these panelists and prepare some good questions, but if you think of any during the webinar, please feel free to submit those through the Q&A feature on Zoom, and, and we'll try to work them in toward the end. Uh, so let's get started with some introductions. Uh, my name is Greg Dick. I'm an engineering director at Huddle, and I'm going to be moderating the panel today. And I'll be joined with the, by these uh, four fantastic leaders within our industry who are going to share their experiences and insights. Uh, so first up is Romina Suarez. Romina works on the developer experience team at Automatic, uh, where she is focused on hiring other engineers and improving the experience of hiring and growing engineers at Automatic. Welcome, Romina. Uh, next is Allison McMillan. Allison is the head of engineering at Forum, which is the platform that powers dev.to. She's been hiring remotely in multiple industries and companies for over a decade. Allison loves creating, leading, and supporting people-centric, inclusive distributed teams. She's currently hiring for a number of roles, and you should DM her to ask about them. Next is Miriam Dayana. Miriam is a director and people manager at PathStream, where she supports a fully distributed team in five time zones across three continents. Very impressive. Uh, Miriam's passion is proving technology and the jobs surrounding it are not for the elite. Welcome, Miriam. Last but not least is Dave Walters. Dave is the CTO at Hired, the largest AI-driven marketplace matching ambitious tech and sales talent with the world's most innovative companies. At Hired, he is focused on growing a strong distributed engineering team and culture to facilitate the build of amazing products and technology. Again, big welcome to all of our panelists. Now, I want to set the stage for what we're talking about today. The pandemic started about two years ago, which is just wild to think about. And so much has changed in our lives during that time. Many of us were forced to start working remotely, whether we liked it or not. But as it turns out, a lot of us really liked it. And companies started to realize that it's not so bad. More companies than ever are now hiring remote employees. But at the same time, more people than ever are applying for those remote positions. So today, we want to talk about what you as an individual can do to stand out among the crowd when looking for a remote role. So uh, I'm going to kick it off with questions. You've heard from me enough. It's time to hear from the panelists. Uh, Miriam, I want to come to you with this first one. Uh, I want to give the audience some insights into, you know, what does the process look like on the hiring side when somebody uh, is applying for a remote position? So what does that look like for you and your company? Yeah, so at Patstream, we recently hired an internal technical recruiter, which has taken some of the responsibilities off of the people managers. Um, so she does the sourcing, recruiting. She's the one who's actually reviewing applications at this point. And if there is an application that is on the border, maybe it's unclear or unsure if they should go forward, then she might ask one of us to look at it. But for the most part, we're not reviewing applications. And um, that does like add another layer to it for those people who are applying. It's for me, it's, it's clearly an employee market. And because there's so many opportunities um, for people to work really anywhere, there's a lot more competition between the companies. Like we have to differentiate ourselves to draw the best talent. So in that sense, it, it adds some, you know, incentive for us as companies to do our best. But at the same time, there are a ton of, of, uh, applications coming in. So it's also competitive on the um, applicant side. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, Dave, a similar question for you. Um, you know, at Hired, maybe you've got some extra insights into uh, trends across the industry. And I'm curious if there's anything uh, you've seen in, in process on the hiring side, specific for remote positions. Yeah, um, I mean, definitely in terms of trends, there's been a, a significant shift towards uh, more and more remote engineers and remote hiring, right? Um, not, not surprising, right? This is something that has been shifting for many years. Um, 
I think as many of us know, and I'm sure a lot of the audience, uh, that engineers have been wanting remote work for a long time. There's been a lot of companies that maybe were a little hesitant to, to open that up too much. Uh, but the pandemic um, really, really gave everybody that opportunity to see how well it can work. Um, so there's a, a significant shift there for sure. Um, you know, in terms of our overall process, we we have the benefit of, of using our own platform, our own marketplace platform to help to source candidates uh, for our team. We, we do a lot of hiring as well. Um, similar to what Miriam said, we have our own internal technical recruiters also that are that are sorting through that platform. Um, doing a lot of the initial uh, reach out to make sure that there's a, a good general fit before passing it on to hiring managers. Um, process, you know, a lot of it looks similar to what it did um, when prior to all of us being remote, uh, but there's definitely some significant differences, right? Uh, the, the interviews themselves being remote and using remote tools, whether it's Zoom or Google Hangouts, um, you know, various coding tools that are out there to to uh, allow for um, you know interview coding in in remote aspects, and I apologize. My dog is right next to me. She's uh, decided right now she needs a lot of extra attention, so um, trying not to get distracted too much from her. Um, <clears throat> so, but a lot of those digital tools that are that are helping to facilitate um, those remote uh, interviews now are, are definitely coming into play. Nice, uh, Romina. I, we talked a little bit and uh, you made it sound like the process of your company is actually uh, quite a bit or a little bit different in the sense that you don't do video interviews. So what does that look like for you? I, I think that'd be really insightful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for the most part, we don't really do video interviews. Um, from the start, kind of automatic uh, was distributed and Text interviews are actually what um, the usual process involves. Um, and so instead of going into a Zoom call or Hangouts, um, candidates are invited to a Slack channel um, where they will get to meet um, the team interviewing them and where they will be able to ask questions. And yeah, it's quite different. I don't see that very often. And as a candidate, it can be strange because usually you haven't seen it before. Um, but yeah, what's what's pretty uh, nice about it for candidates, however, <laughs> I always say, you know, when you're in a video call, you kind of, you may have notes, but you're trying to pay attention to the camera. You're trying to sound perfect. And in a text interview, you can just have your notes, you know, and just like focus on the answers. Um, although it does take some, I always recommend, you know, practicing a bit if you haven't done that before, just kind of trying to get used to answering questions um, in short sentences and get used to the tools. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it in terms of interviews. Um, we do have a bit of a different pro process overall, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. I personally haven't been involved in a, a text interview, but I imagine that, yeah, there are some people that would really like that. Um, Allison, I want to come over to you. Uh, when we talked previously, you mentioned reviewing just a mind-blowing number of resumes. Uh, and so uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how many you're going through, how much time can you uh, actually give to a resume? And, and so what do people need to do to make sure that the most important bits are that you notice them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in almost all the positions that I've ever hired for, I am doing the um, the resume review. I'm uh, frequently working with a talent partner, um, you know, to, to get a sense. But uh, but for me, I have I've personally reviewed a vast majority of the um, of the resumes. How many come in sort of, you know, depends where I'm working or what company it is. But um, you know, there was there was a time at which I was hiring pretty much nonstop for I don't know fifteen or sixteen months, and so in that in that time frame, just I think that I hit something like three thousand resume reviews, um, and so uh, things that really helped me as I was sort of um, going through is uh, 
bolding, really sort of thinking about the bullet points that you're that you're putting on to make sure that they're they're highlighting the skills that you really want to highlight, like the five or six or you know, maybe eight max things in each role. Um, you know, as your resume gets to older roles, you may have fewer bullet points because it's a little farther in the past. Um, but for me, bold, um, I personally really love that sidebar section that just sort of outlines like tools, stack, like it's a it's a little bit of like a shortcut to like, what can I expect when I look at, uh, you know, when I'm when I'm looking at the rest of your uh, at the rest of your resume. So, um, you know, I, I try my hardest, but I do find that um, when reviewing so many resumes, it's hard when it's just three pages of bullet points without much formatting, font size, bolds, et cetera, to really make sure that I'm getting a full sense of the candidate and what the candidate is offering. Miriam, feel free to chime in. Yeah, so um, I agree with all of that. Formatting, um, highlighting, not like with a highlighter, but highlighting the things that are important to that role in any ways that you meet or exceed the expectations that are in the job description. Um, and then I know we're talking about resumes, but I'm thinking of this kind of as applications, like the full application. If there's an application question, answer it and take time to answer it. Because oftentimes that one question is going, I know for our process, if you don't answer that question or if you are um, kind of flippant with your answer, then we take that very seriously. Makes sense. Uh, Allison, I want to stick with you for a minute here. And uh, you know, think about when you're quickly going through these resumes, what are some of the things that are worth calling out as green flags or red flags, things that you quickly notice? Um, are there any of them that are unique for remote work? Mm, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, oftentimes I am not just looking for uh, technical skills, but also core skills, um, right? So if bullet points also highlight um, ways that you maybe improve the department or a team or a company as a whole, something about your, you know, collaboration and communication. Um, you know, I think what Miriam said about how you like met or exceeded expectations of, of what was in the, of what was in the job description um, are, are great, but, um, you know, beyond sort of like ship this feature, did this thing. And that, that is important. Um, I think also having some bullet points about uh, core, core skills. Um, and again, when looking at remote work, great right, communication is really important, especially written communication. That's, you know, the, the, um, the point about answering application questions, it is actually amazing how frequently people don't answer those questions or how often they just, you know, like think that people aren't reading those. But if you're working in a remote environment, um, especially for us at Forum, we hire all over the world. So there is, you know, asynchronous communication, written communication is incredibly important to us. So we look at those questions as an additional way to signal how you, how you communicate your thoughts and opinions on things. Nice. Uh, Dave, similar question for you. Uh, when you're looking through resumes and applications, what are, what are some red flags or, or green flags that you might notice that people wouldn't necessarily think are red or green flags? Yeah, I definitely want to double down on what Allison is saying. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, we all recognize some of the core skills when you're, you're bringing on remote employees, especially remote engineers, are your communication, documentation abilities, collaboration, right? Aside from the, the core technical skills that you're hiring for. Um, so, you know, as hiring managers are going to be looking at your resume, looking at any interaction with you um, as indicators for how well you will do and how well you perform in these skills. So uh, if you're missing out on some of the requirements for that, that job submission, right, that is going to uh, be an indicator that, that maybe you're not quite thorough enough and, and, and that may impact you in, in that fully remote environment. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, green flags, I would say, aside from, from adding your technical skills uh, and listing out, which is important, um, try to give an indication of, of how you've used those, right? Not just that you, you have that experience, right? Or, or you're just listing it as a, a list of bullet points, but um, really give an indication that you have um, professional experience in, in using it. And, and you know, that, that recruiter or hiring manager can connect those dots. Um, 
you know, another thing to be cautious of, uh, I know for a lot of hiring managers is, is moving around too frequently, right? If, if you see a candidate that maybe has 10 different jobs over 10 years, um, averaging their stay at about one year of, of, at each, um, that's a pretty strong signal to a hiring manager that if, if they hire that individual, there's a good chance um, they may be looking to leave in a, in a year from there. Um, at the very least, they're going to have some questions for that candidate about that and, and try to get a sense for what really motivates them and, and how they might uh, try to retain them. Um, <clears throat> moving around is not necessarily a, a dangerous thing, right? But uh, I, would in, I would say Canvas should have a, a good story behind any of those, uh, any of those moves. Nice. Uh, Miriam. Uh, go ahead and yeah, here. Um, something that he just said it's going to come back to me but one thing that I was thinking as well was um, ways to show self-motivation in your resume and um, Allison kind of kind of touched on it but not just you know did this ship that but a lot of times especially whenever you have different time zones there might be down times where you don't have another feature or another story per se, but you take on an initiative and you have this period of time where everyone else is asleep, but you're still working. So what do you do with that time? Do you have some examples um, to show where you were motivated to, to find the next problem and fix it? Oh, I know what it was when you mentioned um, written communication. So not just the resume, any emails that are being sent because most of your communication, which is why I think it's it's pretty interesting, the text interview, because most of what you're going to be doing on a daily basis is in text with everyone on the team. Um, but during that interview process or even during the application phase, let's say any correspondence, like if you reach out to folks on LinkedIn, how personable are you? How interesting are you to talk to or to um, understand how, how easy it is to understand you in those types of communications? Allison, looks like you have more thoughts on this too. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, if you're earlier in uh, in your career or, you know, different jobs provide a, a huge variety of ways to get an experience in communication and collaboration. Some workplaces are really good at it and some workplaces are really not so great at it. And so, um, you know, on resumes, I would say also don't be afraid to add like a additional relevant um, skills or something section. And that's where you can um, communication, collaboration, the ability to work remotely, communicate, show initiative, that doesn't just have to be through jobs and through work. It could also be through a PTA, through, um, you know, extracurriculars that you organize, like it can be through a whole variety of, uh, of, of opportunities and life experiences. And so even if you can't tie that stuff directly to a job, there are ways on your resume um, to put sort of like additional relevant experience and call out the ways in which you've excelled and, you know, uh, in, in those sorts of core skills, even if it is outside of a bullet point that you can put under a job listing. Yeah, that's a really good insight. I feel like a lot of people don't realize that they should put things on the resume that aren't directly related to work. Um, I want to flip the script for a little bit here. We've been talking about uh, red flags and green flags for the individual on, on their resume or application and whatnot. Uh, but you know, a lot of companies are still somewhat new to remote work. They may not have figured it out. Uh, so Romina, I want to come to you with this question. What should an individual look for from that company during an interview process to figure out, are they going to provide a positive remote experience for me? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And honestly, super important always, but especially now uh, for everyone switching to remote work. So I think, first of all, I think it's pretty nuanced. I think it depends a lot on who you are, what you actually need to succeed. So that's the first thing. It's not just a generic, oh, you know, um, do they use text interviews? It's not. Um, so it's going to be really what, what I would recommend and what I do is look at the things that matter more to you while you're looking for remote. If you are trying to... Uh, have more async collaboration, then probably that's something you want to dig into. How are they communicating daily? Um, how do projects get planned? 
look for information about their day-to-day, -day, really. Um, because there are all sides of this, right? You have remote companies where you're going to have meetings every day, tons of them. And then some where you're not. And it's not that one is better than the other, it's that you really do need to look inside what you want. Um, the other thing I do like to look at is uh, how, when it comes to their teams, like for me, it's such a, a great um, green flag of sorts. Um, if I see that, you know, this is a company that has been distributed for a while, but also that has the leadership team working remotely. Um, it tends to be quite hard when only the individual contributors are remote and then all leadership is somewhere in an office um, because it, it's gonna drive the culture, it's gonna drive who gets opportunities. So that's a big flag that I think it's worth keeping in mind. Um, another thing is really take advantage of the, the questions you can ask in interviews and try to find out how do people actually get to know each other? Um, you should be able to like have casual conversations, to have like water cooler type conversations. Just because you're remote, it doesn't mean that you're just, you know, uh, writing code and never chatting with someone. Uh, so try to find out about those things. How do you approach things like team meetups? And I know in COVID times, that's less common, but still try to find out what happened during the pandemic in that sense. Um, I think those kind of how you build a culture, how you build interactions is super important on something candidates should be digging into. Nice. Uh, Miriam, similar question for you. If you know, if you were going to go interview for a new remote position today, what would be some of your top questions that you would ask to make sure that this is going to be a good remote experience? Oh, you're muted. What are the preferred communication platforms that are being used? Um, what's the preferred cadence? Similar to what Romina was saying, like how often are they expecting to hear from each other? Um, my first remote role was in 2006. And at the time that was my, I, I thought that was everything that I wanted in a role. And I got the role and hated it because we were fully distributed and we would have stand up every day. And then after stand up, like everything would go dark. And I'm very much a collaborator. Um, I like to talk to people when I want to talk to them. And if that's not possible, then it can be very detrimental to my mental health and my work. So um, being able to ask those types of questions and get to the heart of what the current team sees as normal. How often are we collaborating? Um, what are some of the expectations of asynchronous collaboration? If someone starts a design doc and asks for reviews, is there a sense from the team of how soon that should happen? Or could you be waiting for days? That type of thing. Nice. All right, coming back to uh, what the individual uh, should, be, should be doing. Um, we talked a little bit before about uh, you know, if a, if a person has so much time and energy to devote to looking for a new job, uh, should they apply to every position under the sun that they can find? Or, or should they focus their efforts down a little bit more? Uh, so Dave, I wanna, I wanna come to you with this one. Um, what is your opinion on how should they be spending their energy? Um, what, what strategies should they be using? Definitely. Um, and I think this is like a lot of things, one that's, that's not necessarily a one size fits all uh, type of question or, or answer. Um, you know, if, if it's a candidate that is, or an engineer that is just starting out relatively early in their career, not necessarily their first job, but, but still relatively early in their career, um, personally, I would recommend casting a wide, rat, uh, wide net, um, not just from a, a standpoint of having more opportunities and a higher likelihood of, of uh, landing a job, but um, you know, from my own experience, and I think a lot of people have gone through this, right? You don't know what you don't know, right? You, you know the companies you've worked in, you know the types of, of platforms you've worked on, 
um, at that point in time, but there's so much more out there and, and you don't know what you really feel about them until you've had an opportunity to work in those environments. Um, you know, I can speak from personal experience. I've, I've um, a lot of times taking paths that uh, didn't necessarily seem apparent to me and, and have been very pleasantly surprised by what, uh, what I found in working on them. And I think a lot of, of engineers would find similar if they kind of opened themselves up to that. Um, you know, but then of course, as you get further on in your in your career and you've had a lot of those different experiences, you maybe start to to really hone in on what you do like, what what motivates you, um, and what's going to be best for your your mental well being, right, and all that stuff. And and then it makes sense to really um, get much more selective, especially in a climate like this, where as as some of the panelists have already said, it really is an engineer's market, um, and they have the opportunity to. Uh, to land a good job out there. So at that point, um, you know, don't don't waste your time on uh, uh, applying to a, a role that you're probably not really going to be happy with, um, and focus in on on the ones that you really are passionate about. Nice, uh, Allison. A similar question for you. I'm curious if uh, if you have any examples of candidates that you know showed that they put in extra effort when they were applying to one of your open roles, something that made them stand out? Um, yeah, I think for for me, it's really come down to those application questions. So I, uh, I tend to have processes that have a few more application questions um, because it shows that a person is, is actually interested in the company, in the role. You know, I'm not talking like 15 long form answers, but you know, three, four, five, which tends to be more than than a lot of other places have um, that really ask questions about, you know, uh, a change that you wanted to make and how you went about advocating for it or, you know, different um, form is an open source company. So we ask about like, what what's your interest in open source and for working in, uh, you know, an open source code base, um, just asking a few of those uh, of those additional questions. And you can really tell when somebody like gets halfway through the questions and are like, eh, I don't feel like answering these last two or when they just put like a dash line in all of the, like in all of the question answers. Um, so I found application uh, questions to be, to be really, really helpful. Um, and I would just add in terms of like, do you apply for a lot of jobs or a few jobs? You know, if you can try to get a sense of what the interview process is, I know that more places are trying to put what you can expect out of the process uh, just right there on the on the job. I mean, for me, it's super, super important that we make as few rounds and the rounds as concise as possible and that every round is both us learning something about the candidate and the candidate learning something that they think is really important for their working style from us. Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, tech interviews uh, vary wildly at different companies. And so if you can get a sense of the process, you can also get a sense of like, oh, I may be dealing with 20, you know, six to eight hour take home code challenges at the same time versus, uh, you know, versus just different, different processes and how different companies conduct their interview process. Nice. Um, Romina, I want to come to you. Very similar question again. Uh, with the text interview process, do you have any examples that you can think of, of where it seemed like somebody put in extra effort? Yeah. So kind of similar to Alison, um, we get, so before the interview, when we have application questions, and I find the answers to those to be super valuable um, and really where I see a lot of candidates kind of shine. Um, when it comes to interviews, uh, something I did not mention before is that many of our processes don't actually have interviews anymore. Um, so it's even more important to do a preview and to do like answers to questions there. Uh, but coming back to uh, how people shine in interviews, for me, what I've seen uh, both in Automatic and before, um, when it comes to, to candidates um, doing great in an interview is really showing how they have managed to collaborate with their teams remotely. When someone brings me like a specific example of like a debugging situation asynchronously, 
or when someone brings me a hard problem that they worked with a team in, that usually puts that candidate pretty high up because it's super focused on collaboration. Now, this is dangerous to take as advice because you are going to see many companies where you won't be able to just be like, oh, I fixed this with my team. They're going to ask you what you fixed specifically and how. <laughs> um, so again, I'm very sorry that all my answers are like, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to add one, one real thing um, to, to that as well on our preview and is please find yourself like a hype person. I see so many candidates don't shine because they're just trying to be so humble and like have no idea of what their actual skills are. And like, that's me so often as well. Um, so like I find yourself a hype person to prepare for interviews and like to review what you send. Please, I'm begging you um, because yeah, everyone else is probably giving themselves quite a lot of hype. If you're not, you should. <laughs> yeah, that, that is such a good insight. Everybody would benefit from a quality hype person. Yeah. Uh, Miriam, uh, I see you started typing an answer, but I think it's probably worth talking about this one. Uh, I know we mentioned cover letters briefly when we talked previously, but um, let's talk about the importance of that. Is, is that extra effort? And then the question was uh, from the Q&A, um, what do employers look for in cover letters that are red flags? Yeah, so um, there was a debate, or maybe it still is ongoing, I don't know. I kind of sneak in and out of social media, so I'm halfway relevant. Um, but there was some conversation on Twitter about cover letters being obsolete, and I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure yet. Only because whenever I see a cover letter, it can break up the monotony for me, and I oftentimes pay a little bit more attention. Um, some red flags are like, whenever it's clearly cut and paste and they forgot to change the position to your position or the company name to your company name. And it's just like, oh, this was an opportunity. Um, but I do feel like cover letters can help you if you show specific interest or specific research that you've done about that particular company or that particular role, especially for folks who maybe have non-traditional paths or who have um, skills that they are bringing from other industries or are early in their career, it can be a way to highlight. And I've read some long ones like cover letters. I don't know, they read differently. They, they're a little bit more fun to read than resumes. Um, reasonably long, like when I say long, I mean like a few paragraphs. I don't, I don't wanna read pages, but I feel like it's an opportunity to stand out in those situations where you have an actual person who is reviewing the applications um, and where it's gonna matter to that person. So it's not one size you know, fits all, but I can see the benefit of a cover letter in certain situations. And then as far as red flags, just reiterating like, comb through it, take a beat, step away from it, come back to it, read it again, and make sure that it's representing you well. Nice. Romina, did you have more thoughts on that? All right. Uh, so I want to talk about um, LinkedIn. Anytime that I bring up LinkedIn, I often I get groans because in, in a sense, especially with college kids, a sense of, do I really have to do this thing? Um, and so, Dave, I want to come to you. Uh, in your opinion, how important or unimportant is it for somebody looking for their next role to have uh, a well put together LinkedIn profile. Yeah, great question. And I, and I I take a little bit of the of Miriam's cover letter stance on that, right? In terms of if you don't have it, it it's not going to preclude you from from getting a, a job or role. Um, but it, it can it can add value, right? It can just be one of those things that gives you a little bit more exposure, a little bit more clarity on on what your background and experience is. Uh, the caveat to that, I will say, is um, depend or re so long as you keep it up to date, right? Because uh, there's I've seen too many uh, LinkedIn profiles where it's clear they have not touched it in five years, and um, you know you you kind of just throw it away as a data point because at that point it's untrustworthy. Uh, but if it looks like it's reasonably up to date, if it's got a uh, a profile picture there, even if it's not the 
the person's face, right? But it's just something more creative and, and beyond just the stock uh, uh, photo. Um, you know, it, it can provide some additional uh, benefit for the candidate. Nice. Allison, similar question for you is, is LinkedIn part of your process? Would you recommend candidates uh, put together a profile? Yeah, um, for me, it's not a it's not a make or break. The opportunities that I see for LinkedIn is, you know, I mentioned before, like resume review and not trying to sort of shove all the bullet points into your resume. For me, that's that's where like you can put all the things, anything that you like, all the things that you've done on your like on your LinkedIn profile. And so where you might just provide sort of like a snapshot or like a hint or the top five bullet points of a role that you had on your resume, um, you know, you can, you can add more to what that looks like on LinkedIn, you can add, you know, courses that you've done for yourself, or, you know, just really like all, all sorts of stuff. Um, I sort of take there's a question, there's a little bit of a question about sort of self marketing, I take like a blog, LinkedIn, uh, you know, social, I sort of take all of that together in one clump as like none of them are make or breaks, but like the links are there, I'll check them out sort of thing. Nice. Uh, so this next one, this next question, um, I think is going to be a really important one uh, for those people that discovered they like remote work and, and maybe they're going to be interviewing for their first fully remote job. Um, so Miriam, I want to start with you on this one. Uh, if you are interviewing somebody that's lacking remote experience, maybe they don't have any truly remote positions on their resume, what are you looking for to gauge how effective they'll be as a remote employee? And, and mm -hmm. what can that person do to convey confidence that they'll be an effective remote worker? So I would be, I would probably be wary of them having any confidence if they haven't done it before. I would actually look for just inquisition. I want them to be asking the right questions about remote work if they've never done it before or finding out if they have any remote learning or volunteering um, experience, especially during the pandemic. I think a lot of people just picked up whatever they could do virtually. And so um, if any of that included collaboration or communication, then that can be an insight into for them into how like just a taste of what it might be like. But if you've never done it before, like I mentioned, my first remote job, I just knew like 100% remote was the holy grail and not so much. Um, so I would just look for them to be asking questions around the experience, how it works at our company. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, Dave, go ahead. Yeah. And I I would add to that, I think that there, once you get into the interview process, right, getting, getting past uh, that, that initial uh, step sometimes can be a little bit of a challenge, but once you get into that, um, some strategies that I've seen that, that always go well with me, um, following up, right, making sure you're proactive in following up after a, a conversation um, doesn't just have to be the traditional thank you for your time email, right, but um, Taking something that was discussed in that in that uh, conversation and expanding on it um, is a great way to just show that that communication abilities that you have, your your collaboration, your ability to um, to follow up on a task without being prodded, right? Uh, which are all good skills for for a remote work environment. Um, you know, we've all had those opportunities where we're, we're in a conversation and we don't think about something and then five minutes after we're like, oh, I should have said this, right? That's, it's not too late. You can follow up in that email and, and give some of those thoughts, right? And, and that shows that ambition. Um, and, and like I said, it, it shows that hiring manager or the recruiter that you're somebody that is going to uh, collaborate very well asynchronously um, and in that remote environment. Nice, very nice. Uh, and then Romina, similar question for you. Uh, if you've got somebody that's applying and the the whole, uh, the setup will be brand new to them, what, what kind of things would you look for uh, to know that they're gonna be effective in, in that scenario? Yeah. So right now, 
I have it easy in that sense um, because the process is so optimized for a distributed experience. You're just gonna have the same, uh, you're just gonna be demonstrating the same thing everyone else is, which is to say, you know, because we have asynchronous communication from the start, from interviews, co-test, and automatic does a trial process, which is quite literally a test drive of like how you work um, is paid. So someone who hasn't worked remotely, if they can get uh, successfully through their trial, if they can show, you know, self-drive, if they can show good uh, writing skills, and I don't mean, you know, writing a book. <laughs> uh, it's just like, can you actually explain your ideas in writing clearly um, to other humans? Uh, that to me is, is such a core uh, critical part of asynchronous work that that is the thing I would focus on if I didn't have any remote experience. It's just becoming really good at explaining things asynchronously in written form. Um, the other thing that automatic in particular, um, and, and I focus a lot on is, can someone you know, ask good questions about a project, about um, a challenge, uh, and then take that and run with a project, you know, kind of check in about progress and so on. So self-drive with writing skills, absolutely critical. Uh, but again, the good thing is because everything is so optimized for that, you are not gonna be put into like extra tests. Uh, you know, if you're a veteran of remote or if you are a newbie, it's just gonna be demonstrating the same things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then Allison, um, can you think of any examples of uh, something that has been on somebody's resume or in an interview that made you think like, maybe this person, maybe remote work is not for this person? Um, not on resumes I have had. So one thing that I like to do is ask uh, in interviews, what, what are some of the challenges about working remotely? Because again, sort of like Miriam said, I want to make sure that they've, it's really easy to be like, I get to work in pajamas or, you know, sort of whatever. But like remote work actually, I think requires more effort because you have to be really like, you have to be collaborative and communicative and uh, just thoughtful in a whole lot of different ways than if you're passively seeing folks in, in the office every day. And so, um, you know, I will, I will often ask folks, like, what are some of the challenges about working remotely? Um, it also gives me a sense of uh, working remotely during the pandemic is, in my opinion, very different than working remotely in general, right? Like, I used to go and work from a coffee shop with a group of people once or twice a week. There were, like, one or two co-working spaces I would pop into. I have not done any of that for two years. And it is, it's a very different vibe than like you know then the my previous eight years of working remotely sort of thing um so you know i want to make sure that people have thought about um what structures they might need how they how they work best remotely i have had people say things like uh, a challenge that they have working remotely is like remembering that they have a meeting or like showing up to, we do very few meetings, but you know, like, like showing up to the few meetings that to me is, you know, that's like a red flag. That's like a, there aren't that many meetings. I, you know, it's, it's like good. To, if, if there's a meeting, it's like really important. There's an agenda, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so I think that there are uh, less that I see on resumes and more that sort of come up in, in interviews that I'm like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not actually so sure about this. Yeah, that's that's a really good insight. I'm curious, what's been the best answer that you've gotten to that question of, you know, what's a what's a challenge to working remote? Um I think a really good answer is when somebody talks about communication and recognizing their communication and other people's communication styles and sort of talks about how if you don't explicitly state those or make those things sort of known, make the rest of your team aware of it it's easy to sort of, you know, fall by the wayside. And so, you know, making sure that they're like proactively, uh, you know, communicating um, that that sort of, I can't think of like a specific answer, but that sort of vibe is, uh, I think is a really strong answer. 
Awesome. We're about up on time, but Romina, you got your hand up. I want to let you chime in here, and then we'll wrap it up. Oh, yeah, just a quick one. But um, yeah, the, on top of what Alison was saying, uh, it's kind of like there are kind of good enough answers and then, and then really bad ones. Like you don't have to you know, try for the perfect answer about the remote challenges. You just have to try not to go for the really bad ones. Like I don't like people. That's not a good reason for remote work still working with people. Um, and one quick thing, sorry, is we never really tested people explicitly about what it took to work in an office, but we do that for remote workers. And I'm just gonna drop that one there, but I think yeah, it's important good. for candidates and for us because some of us are nightmares in offices and should have been tested, but we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that about wraps it up for this panel. Uh, I want to uh, give a big thank you uh, for all the good insights from our panelists. Um, the conversation doesn't have to stop right now, though, because we're all going to head over to the Lead Dev Slack in the remote working channel. So come join us over there for more discussion. Uh, thank you to all of our audience members for joining the webinar, and we hope to see you next time.